for coming to this time. Let's go ahead and get started. So welcome. I'm glad you were all here. Um, we always take a minute at the beginning of these meetings to do introductions. Many of us know each other, but some may not. So let's let's go ahead and do that. And maybe we'll start with Carly so we don't forget her. So we've got at least one person on the phone. So Carly, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay, this is Carly White. I'm a um, care manager from Holiday Pediatrics. Great, well, welcome. All right, and I'm Mindy Tuller. I manage the medical home portal, which we always talk about in these meetings a little bit, and I facilitate these meetings. Um, I work for Dr. Chuck Norland at the University of Utah. Uh, I'm Gary Baragoshi. I'm one of the UPXQI coaches, and I'm also working with Mindy um, on these meetings. <laughs> I'm Don Bentley. I'm one of the quality improvement coaches with Utah Health. I'm with them. I'm the health professional and the key scientist here at the Maria Castro. I'm a care coordinator at Health Link. Lisa Hamby. I'm also a care coordinator at Health Link. Evaluation of what's needed. That's all they do. They don't. They don't. 
what I'm not seeing on the portal is who you call and what what the process is and what the steps are. And she was, it, you could tell she was just really frustrated. It would be so great, wouldn't it, if there was an algorithm <laughs> out there that said, okay, you're in the Canyon School District. These are the bodies that you need to contact. If this one doesn't know what to do, then contact this one. Wouldn't it would be super helpful? Yeah, I don't know how possible that is, but maybe we can work on getting something of a framework in, in there. Because I think this comes up all the time. There are, there are things, right, that are available if you know the right words. If you say it at the right time, the, the right, right person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's super helpful. Um, coming back really quickly, though, to the vehicle modification. Um, is it the Utah Assistive Technology Foundation that um, Gina was mentioning? Okay. Um, and I would assume that maybe there are other foundations that do help monetarily that might be applicable. I mean, okay. Um, we haven't found very many that will actually do, um, well, okay, backtrack. Independent living centers, if you can get in when their funding cycle at the beginning of it, that they get their new money July 1st, and many times there's a waiting list. Sometimes they will help with those home and vehicle modifications, but um, they're at the waiting list because, as you can imagine, that is one of the most needed pieces for a lot of families. But that is an option is to make sure that the family knows about the independent living centers. And um, then there are some private family foundations that come and go. And um, we just recently found a, a list of some of those granting foundations that we're, re we're right now going through a vetting them. And then I will send them over to make sure they're all in the portal and then maybe even do one list. Because it's so that's one of the things is we find that we may list them. But unless there are like specifically that says this helps with that, it's too hard to navigate. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of definitely what the beauty of a statewide parent training and information center is in the family voices is keeping them on those resources, the integrated services program, and, you know, so that if there's a new one that comes about, hopefully, you know, we can get that information out to the care coordinator to answer the family. So hopefully that, that makes sense, but um, we've got a couple specific ones that we can point out in our email that will go out, um, including contacting the independent living centers and um, the Utah Assistive Technology Foundation in terms of the funding piece and the new cast of actual modifications and the physical part of that. Um, but in a pinch, a great resource is always the Utah Family Voices and Utah Parent Center. Um, and there are a few brochures for you at the Utah Center for Assistive Technology up here on this front table that you want to take a look at. Great. Great. Okay. Hopefully. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Anybody else have any um, legalism? Um, I have this family of kind of setting. Um, mom is incarcerated in an upjail apply. Guardianship. She's now been laid. Um, she's now been um, been to a suit by the aunt. Aunt says she was never legally uh, represented in the in custody hearing, mm -hmm. and so if she's appealing to the Supreme Court, understandably, in the Supreme Court case, but um, and she's being asked. It was very, very confusing because she didn't the word custody. The word custody, so I really don't understand why she could be named as an appellant. And um, the Attorney General's office is just as reluctant as we just when we've written letters to them because we feel like it was really maybe their responsibility that they should have been named. <laughs>
So, so they can just try and yeah. She has custody. She has custody. She has been named in the that custody was awarded without representation to the mother. Gotcha. So Pam is now having to defend herself in the court system and the cost of the astronomical. They don't have the money there. They don't. They're not such low income that they probably um, Right, and that, that oh, oh my gosh. Well, the child needs to be adapted to the right of the company. What I'm wondering is what state agencies were involved with the child. Monopoly. You just wonder who was in that decision making process? What? Maybe the decision that whoever was working after them. You know. One of the other things that we have to do is do that to um, the foster parents or you know, the parents. Do they have any benefits to the work? You know, a lot of people have this legal. Like to this day, we have like a legal uh, a writer that we can pick up as employees that we can family law. So maybe looking at that might be another option to get some advice or some help along those lines as well. They may not have that option, but it's something to do. Can you tell me what services you put in the Utah bar that has the free consultation in it? What is in our bar? No. Yeah, so I had to look at the court. You saw legal services and we're stuck in Hushdown. I would go back to who she got her guardianship through as well, because they may help to um, have the documentation and such because of the kinship type relationship, which sometimes changes how they look. Discounted 
legal assistance for families seeking guardianship.
or get an email return quite quickly. Um, otherwise, it would probably be the following day or the following business day. But um, they're, they're set up to be able to help folks navigate the portal and ultimately get connected to you know, the kinds of services and supports that they need. So that's in place, and we want to encourage folks to, to do that. Um, certainly, we would anticipate that this might be um, used more by people who don't have care coordination and a medical home that they're experiencing, but it's available for anyone. So wanted to make those things um, uh, known. I will talk back to our, our PowerPoint, and now we're going to switch to our next section. And so we're excited. Um, I think probably you all saw that we're going to talk a little bit about how to implement the processes. Um, in, in, a, in a practice in an organization, uh, and then we're going to have some folks who've done this already or are in the process of doing it come up and, and talk to us a little bit about their experiences. But before we do that, I wanted to um, step back just a little bit and kind of remind us about um, kind of what the pillars of the care coordination process are and, um, and it greatly simplify what care coordination in a medical home are. But they are definitely kind of those things in which all that other really important stuff happens. And that is that, of course, you've got to identify um, those needs and assess them before you can really begin to act and, and help that family. And then, of course, there's the, the need to create a formal care plan that has those goals in it, that has those identified um, problems, all of the, the history that's important and relevant. Um, and then certainly implementing that care plan Many of you are doing all of these kinds of things already to one degree or another in one way or another, whether it's really formalized and documented or if it's happening a little bit more ad hoc, but um, that, that implementing is really where we connect those families to those needed referrals and resources. And then ultimately, we need to evaluate what we've done, right, to make sure that we've done something that's useful and helpful and is having the desired um, outcomes and then make changes if that's, if that's um, uh, what needs to take place at that point. And so, um, let's see if I can pop out to this page to talk just a little bit more about um, kind of the, the things that happen in between these. So assessing and identifying needs. Um, so activities that are based on a hopefully comprehensive assessment that would include psychosocial um, as well as kind of the medical assessment of the child and family and identification of the needs. Um, and of course these will, these will change over time as well, right? So, um, develop and use an assessment tool which will assist in gathering information you will need to develop a plan of care. So we're going to have a look at at least two um, assessment um, forms, and I think probably they, there are a lot of different names. Um, an intake form might be the way this is called, you know, but that's, I think, uh, a lot of organizations do try and collect that information at the beginning of working with the family or the patient. Um, developing a plan of care. After identifying the needs, um, a plan of care is developed with the family and goals and outcomes are discussed. Um, the care coordinator may clarify with the family which action steps the family will be addressed and which will be addressed by the care coordinator. Um, that's certainly an ideal there. And then um, implementing the plan. Um, actions taken to work toward the desired outcomes. Um, identifying service providers and programs that will fulfill the needs of the family. Um, the care coordinator should organize and assist the families with those referrals. Um, coordination of care with specialty physicians, schools, other agencies, other professionals, and and connect them with those community resources. So that's kind of the backdrop for what we hope to move into and, and really have a robust discussion with you all today. So we want to hear from you know our, our panel folks who have um, already started this process to some degree within their organization, but we want to hear your questions too. We want to listen to um, what your um, questions are in terms of addressing this process implementation in your organization. You know, if that's something that you're thinking about, if that's something that's already happening, what barriers are you experiencing, where are you, and how can what these folks have already done benefit you um, within your individual organization. Um, and then before that, Sean, come up real quick. We'll have a little uh, 
So, and I'm really grateful that um, we have some bakers who brought you some chocolate chip cookies. I don't know if they use the, the Toll House um, control recipe or if they had a special recipe that they used. But thank you for the people who brought to share. Okay, so maybe we'll pass those around or, or encourage people to feel free to get up and have a chocolate chip cookie mm -hmm. in the spirit. Um, yeah, so that's really interesting. I like the idea of having some kind of way of documenting what a, what a basic family experience would be, right? So, and I don't know that that exists, but maybe there could be a series of kind of go-to organizations when you, you know, and I know Gina would know uh, what these might be, but, and then there could be variations that get drawn pulled from that depending on what the family is experiencing and where they are with me. So having a way to document that, I don't know. Cool. Well, and having lots of options to change things. For one family, one thing might be perfect at one time, but right. not the right thing at another time. Right. Like, yeah. It's a challenge though, to keep it all straight and keep it cool. up to date um, and easily accessible. A little more challenging than baking a really good chocolate chip cookie, probably, but a nice analogy nonetheless, I think. So, tasty one, a tasty analogy for sure. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're going to ask our panelists to come up now. And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about their experiences with um, really doing assessments and their and then care plans um, uh, in their organization. So we've got four chairs. Let's grab a few more. How many do you need? I don't know. I think we need probably six. Okay. Maybe, maybe. And I can grab um, one or two from back here, too. I'll just grab one. Okay. Okay. Super. Come on up, guys. Jenna? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we need some more chairs right here. You guys just want to block I don't know. I don't know that we have anything to put in there. There's that extra one down here. Oh, I'll grab that.
Wow, that was terrible. <laughs> that was a lot of. Uh, I'm so sorry. I turned it into a PDF to plug in as an image, and um, okay. Foreign language. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's probably not going to be helpful. Oh, my God. Oh, you're getting really close. My PowerPoint looks awful, you guys. Maybe I'll pull up these um, forms uh, from Go to Meetings, so. though. Why don't you go ahead, um, Jenna, if you wouldn't mind, because your um, experience has been thus far to ha have an assessment form that you were using. Right. So that's been in, in the works. You've been using that. Um, maybe talk a little bit about how that's gone. Okay. And then what um, prompted you to start working on a form that was more specific to you know, care planning okay. and different from the assessment. And also okay. So um, the assessment that she <laughs> showed is like the third or fourth version of the assessment plan that I, or the care assessment that I started with. And I adapted a lot from the Boston Children's Hospital like care assessment um, that they were going through. And basically like it started because I was going into rooms and saying to patients like, so what can I help you with? And um, like families who are in crisis or, you know, like the, the patient is sick or something, uh, I was not getting a lot of feedback. So I wanted to take kind of a more pre, um, preventative type approach instead of going in and like reacting to whatever the family was saying. So I started to develop a form that I could use so I could actually like find out some background on the patient before I went in and then confirm that background and make sure that everything was correct. And then have just kind of like an easier way for me to say, hey, have you, you know, looked into DSPD? Have you done this? Have you done that? And then I can, from that form, kind of like summarize things that the family might need, develop a follow-up plan, and then scan it into the chart or so that the docs can see, you know, what it is we talked about. So um, a lot of the tough part, <laughs> like, the, um, especially like the ER visits, the early intervention, things like that. And on the side, all the specialists, um, I've developed a registry for my, you know, med home tier three patients, so the kids who have like chronic needs. And so I took that first. And on the registry, I have like all of the specialists that they see, the upcoming specialist appointments that they have. And I just start to fill it in on the side there. Um, if I've seen that they're coming in and it's probably a follow-up from like an ER visit or a specialist, I make sure I check the note for that specialist. And that helps me like see what's been going on. And then I can summarize that in like a little task for the doc and send it to the doc, especially if that note is not like in the EMR so that I know that the doc hasn't seen it yet. Um, and then I confirm when I go in the room those specialist appointments with the family. And I found that's been really helpful for a lot of our patients who are seeing multiple specialists. I can say, hey, I have that you have, like, you know, like these three upcoming appointments. Like, do you need anything from us for that? And that's kind of how I approach it. Not like, this is a reminder for you, but like, do you need anything from us? Can I help you with that? Do you need coordination with those? And they're pretty, like, receptive to that. And then when I go in the room, um, I just kind of, like, ask my first question is, like, is there anything causing you stress right now? Or what can I help you with, you know, at this moment? Like, what's your biggest stressor? And a lot of times they'll say, oh, nothing, you know. <laughs> or I dig a little deeper and then I find out, oh, there's this, like, really big underlying thing. And I can go through and just start to, like, check off. So I put on this. These are, like, the most common things that I help my patients with. So a checkbox is a lot easier for me than writing that out every single time. And then the follow-up plan on the bottom, I basically take their needs from that checkbox and put what I'm going to do, and then I put the date next to it. And then when everything is done, I scan it into the chart. So I have like a folder with all of these like assessments in there. So I can go through and check and say, oh, I really need to like follow up on that. And then in our EMR, we have like a whole task system. It's really easy for me to create a task from this follow-up plan to then like make sure that I'm following through or assign it to somebody who might be able to better help, you know, an MA or a doc or, or somebody else. And then I take all of this and my um, 
my plan or my goal for 2016 is to create like chronic care plans for the kids who are frequent flyers, who have, you know, those really like unmanaged chronic conditions or who are just like their families really need help managing those conditions. So my background, I was a special education teacher for a while. Um, so I kind of approached this as like an IEP for the medical side of our kids. So I went through and um, I created like a word uh, form. So I can literally just like fill in all this without messing up any format. And I don't have to worry about like, I'm notorious for like saving over things <laughs> and then having to go back. So this is just like a, a template so I can just click on it and I don't have to worry about saving over anything that I've <laughs> previously um, written. But the, the top part, of course, is just their demographics. And then we miss a lot. There's educational information. So I pull that from the care assessment that I do so I can know, hey, this is the contact information for this school. I coordinate a lot with schools. I would love to coordinate more. So hopefully this will help me coordinate more with schools, get a person to contact, let them know what's going on at school. Um, then at the, in the middle, um, I like to know the challenges that the parents might be facing with that with that child. Sorry if I called him a student. Um, <laughs> with that child, as well as like what might actually be those challenges for that child, so that it kind of helps tailor the rest of the plan. If you know they're having behavioral challenges, you're not going to make a goal for them to like, you know, I don't know, like. I don't know. It's blown my head. But you're not going to make a goal that doesn't address those behavior challenges. Um, and then in the middle, any equipment needs. This helps me coordinate better with like home health. It also helps me know what they might be bringing with them into the appointment so we can be prepared for that. And then the special clinical accommodations is actually a project I'm working on with the parent partner at my clinic. We're trying to make things a little more atmospherically friendly for some of our kids who have um, chronic health conditions, especially sensory needs. Um, our kids with autism who might come in and be afraid of coming in to see the doctor. So we're working on ways where we can try and integrate some more um, appropriate and friendly <laughs> things for those kids when they come in. So that's kind of like our, our little project right there. And then um, this is where it gets more into like the, the clinical side of things. So on here I'm not going to put that they have an ear infection or that they have strep throat unless it's like chronic. So these are like their chronic conditions, cerebral palsy, you know, that's not going to go away. So that's what I put here. And then the ICD-10 code just helps me when I'm filling out orders and paperwork and everything. I don't have to keep looking in the chart for it. And then on the bot, so this middle part is where really I'm, this is my goal this year. So this, this treatment, the clinical goals, trying to coordinate with specialists. So I can read the specialist note and see their follow-up plan and be like, okay, so our goal for this kiddo is to get them into braces and get them, you know, like better able to ambulate around. But that's not me coordinating with the specialist. That's me reading their note and <laughs> figuring that out. So I want to find a way to better coordinate with specialists so that we can all come up with a goal together and getting everybody on the same, like in the same room at the same time, that's impossible. So that's kind of my like plan for this next year is to try and figure out a really like um, Easy, <laughs> easy is the only word that's coming to mind. Way for us to get clinical goals in place across the board. And I mean, I can I can talk to the pediatrician and get their clinical goals and what they're you know what they're wanting to do. But there's so with these chronic care kids, there's so many specialists and so many needs that it's hard for me to know of <laughs> a way to do that. So I have a follow-up date here. So if the clinical goal is they're trying to get, let's say, braces for them to walk, and 
the specialist or care provider responsible was really important to me so that I'm not trying to work on things that other people are also working on. And then the follow-up date is just if they have an appointment with that specialist in the next couple months, you know, or if I have a personal project that I'm working on from my follow-up plan that relates to one of their clinical goals, that's where I would put that date so that I know they need this by this time. And then medications so that we can check them, allergies, um, and then any recent labs that they might have done. And I actually added this after we had that like big meeting here because I, did, I didn't think it was important. <laughs> but come to find out, like it is important. If specialists are ordering labs and we're ordering the same labs, we don't need the parents going twice to the same place. So um, this is really, I found important. And on this, there's like, I have drop down lists and I don't know, can we, does it show in the, yeah, so I have like drop down lists to choose from. Wow. Um, there's a lot like of things and, and ways to type in. So I made it very like friendly so that I don't have to like spend a lot of time typing in. So it took a lot of time to create this, but now I can just go in and click on it for every single one and I don't have to like go through. So where it says like click enter text, I have to click enter, but like there's there's a lot of things embedded in the document that I don't have to go through and you know like spend a lot of time writing it. And then the last page is just their care team. So like if you choose an item from PCP, I have all of our docs at our office listed under there. And then um, the rest, like their facts, I don't. So I just had their phone number, and then I was, I was like, this is not as helpful to me as having their fax number. So I added a column for their facts. So that's really important. And the bottom, just the home nursing or respite care. That's just a note for me to know, like, yes, they have it, so that I don't have to go about trying to get them it. Um, and then I have it implemented the physician signature, the family signature, but my goal for this is for those kiddos with chronic care conditions to sit down with the family. So I go in, usually while they're waiting for the doctor to come in, sit down with the family and like review this. Whether it's their well visit, we see them you know, once a year, just say, hey, and then they have something they can take with them to their specialist or whatever. So this has not been rolled out. My practice wide, I've only done it for a handful of kids. Um, but once I got a form in place, it was a lot easier for me to plug in the information that I already had and that I was assessing as they were coming in. So, you place a hard copy before you go to the family and then, yeah. in there, and then you go to the patient and so, update it? Mm -hmm. I've done it with one patient okay. so far. Um, I filled it out for a handful, but I haven't like implemented it with them. But I've done it for one patient so far, and come to find out, like half the medications we had listed, they weren't taking anymore, or the dosages were wrong. So that was really like that was good for me. But then I can go on because I keep an electronic copy of all of these two, like in a folder. Um, I can go on and update that, and then print it off and give it to the family, and then update their face sheet on our EMR. Um, now that I have like all my drop downs and everything, it took like 10 minutes. Yeah. At this point, it's not implementable in your EMR. No. So I would have to scan it in for it to be there in the EMR. Yeah, I've never even used the flow sheets on our EMR, but <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Greenway. Yeah. And Greenway is for all Wattach, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to clarify. So, so you might have had this and filled that as you could. Yep. Family comes in for a visit, waiting for the doctor. You come in, you printed a copy, yep. you sit down, you mark where things have changed, new information. Right. And then when do you go back and put it in your electronic version before you get them a copy? Yeah. 
while they're meeting with the dog. Great, so it's pretty easy. Yeah, so it's, it's like I can go back and do this. I mean, this is this is not to be done when they're only in there for five minutes and the parent has like seven kids running around and, you know, there's like just complete chaos um, because then they're not paying attention to what it is. Like this is something that I want them to be able to transition with as they're going from provider to provider or, you know, like they're taking it to the school. So the school's not like, hey, can we have a medical representative at the IEP? This can be there. We have our clinical goals, you know, we have all the specialist clinical goals for them, so it's kind of just like a very comprehensive document. And I print it front to back, so it's only two pages. So it's not like this huge, like, thick thing they're trying to take around. It's just like this two-page so thing. Like, yeah. Can you give a hard copy to the yep, parents? You can. can. Back you? Yeah, and, and email is really... Email is lucrative for me to, to send things or to double check things with families if I have established like a connection with them. And yeah, Joanny said like over the phone you can get a lot of the information. Um, the hardest part truly for me right now is just trying to coordinate with specialists to get their like what their long term clinical goals are for the kids. Coordinating with the families hasn't really been much of a struggle. Most of them are willing to just take five minutes. I haven't tried that, no. Yeah. That's really hard to coordinate. Is that? Yeah. It's really hard to coordinate. But like comp care, you know, it's just not efficient. into the room with that patient and and then I can see the different things that like I've recommended or that I've helped them with so I always look through that before I even go into a room with a patient to see if I've done a care assessment with them and to see like what else I can offer them or if they've followed up with some of the other things that we've done. If you email this form to a patient, do you let them enable editing, or do you just so, let them? Yeah, when when this is emailed, all they have to do is click enable editing on the top, and the only things that they're able to fill in are the gray spaces on here. So I would try and fill out as much as I possibly could for the patient, <laughs> and then they can add. So I've been coordinating with one family, and um, I actually did email, just, I said, hey, I'm, um, I have a good relationship with the mom, so I'm like, hey, this is something like a project I'm working on, do you want to help me with it? She's like, sure. So I emailed this to her, and she was able just to go through, I filled out basically everything that I could, and she actually put her own clinical goals in <laughs> for the treatment, but it was really nice to like see what her goals were, and that like tuned into me, so we need to be talking with the families about these clinical goals. It's not just our goals for the patient. Like, the families really need to be involved with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that is kind of interesting. I wonder, um, what if a family has um, a goal that maybe wouldn't be classified as a clinical, that, that would require maybe some you know, steps on their part and you could help, or, you know, um, would that be something to include in here? We, we could. This is mostly just like my clinical like care plan. Okay. 
Um, the other assessment that I use also does like the social and the like community resource needs for that family. So I might put it on there. There. Yeah. Okay. So you've got this. Mm -hmm. okay. And they like they work together. Mm -hmm. But this is this was mostly like my clinical like got it. This is the medical portion yeah. of their care. Yeah. Wasatch does, right? You don't have a secure <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so kidding. You can put PHI in a and then Are we really? Are we really not? I believe that's within, if you're sending email within an uh, email system, once it crosses over, I think I'll mess it off. So, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It triggers that. So, um, like as a disclaimer, health. I haven't emailed anything. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I know that parent, like that parent, is the one receiving it on the other end. Like, hey, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Thank you. We created just a little like thing that says care coordination assessment. So whenever I, yeah, and so, yeah, and it has the date and like when, and it usually links to the visit. So if I can link it to the visit and get everything done that day that they came in, that's great. Um, if not, like I just put the date that I'm scanning it in or the date of the visit, and <laughs> so it's like. But it has its own label. It says care coordination assessment. So, and did you, what feedback did you get from your provider? They like it. I mean, they like it. So, especially the care coordination assessment helps them keep, like, no, keep keep tabs on me, but like, <laughs> know what it is that like I'm doing to try and help the patient. And I don't think they they go in the chart and look a lot at the. Um, Thank you, the assessment. <laughs> but they do look at the tasks that I've created from that assessment because they're actually assigned it. So <laughs> they have to look at it or it keeps, you know, popping up for them. So but they can read, you know, what it is that I've done from that. Do you use it to huddle or anything before the appointment? So usually that's what my task oh, okay. can be. I so I can send them. Um, like for instance, we just had a a kid who got discharged from the hospital, um, I sent like a little task to the, the provider because they had a new diagnosis. So I just said, hey, this kiddo was, you know, diagnosed with this at the hospital. We don't have the record in the EMR. I just wanted you to know before you go in to the to visit with them. So. Yeah, yeah. But, like, if something's not like easy, <laughs> like if it's not easy for me to use, I'm like, what's the point of me doing more work to try and make it usable? So I might as well just amend it so that it is easy for me to use. And so within Wasatch, there is a culture of wanting to do this quality improvement, right? So, um, so kind of maybe a little quickly, if we you guys wouldn't mind the other Wasatch um, piece. Your coordinator is talking a little bit about where your practice is at with this kind of thing. 
She develops it and we use it. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> She's also worked on a, a really great system. It's a, a registry for a tier three patient. I don't know if you talked about it in previous meetings before, but it's it's we've all have learned how to use it and adopted it and are registering our tier three special healthcare needs patients on that, on that registry and it's a really great way of keeping tabs on them. Uh, have you, did you, did you I just heard her mention it at the top of this. Uh, Very yeah. useful. It's like an Excel spreadsheet with all the different doctors and their their yeah, it's really good. It all like kind of works together. The yeah, one like helps the other and vice versa. So it's kind of like a little system. So I think what I'm hearing is that as part quality improvement for your organization, you need to get a special ed school. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> so one of the nice things about Cook about Wasatch is we also have monthly med home meetings that are all the care coordinators across all of our offices. And so we have the benefit of learning from each other, um, which is really nice because every office runs so differently. So you can, I, I kind of make it a point to go visit the other offices. Um, there were a lot of us who've done um, the care coordination through the UPIC grant. It's kind of where we started several years ago. And so we've done things in it, um, in it kind of coordinated care for such a long time. And then you have somebody like Jenna who comes in and she's got this really organized brain. And I had, you know, so we had this nice little registry that we could pull from our EMR, but it wasn't, you know, it was restricted by the EMR. And so then it limits the usability. So then you have somebody like Jenna who comes in and has this beautiful little organized brain and she just, makes this beautiful little highly usable spreadsheet and it's very visually appealing, which her other one is as well. And it just makes it that much more usable. And it makes the job that we do as care coordinators that much more efficient. And we all have similar goals, making sure the families and the physicians that their goals are matching, that the families have the resources that they need to access um, care to get through their insurance, help with schools, and then now we also have somebody that we can go, oh, so what do you know about this in the IEP process? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I think all of us work together to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's really great just within our own culture. So it sounds like the Wasatch organization gives you a lot of um, opportunities. Opportunities, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Encouraged. Yeah, it is. It's definitely one of those things that we've been encouraged that to be kind of the architects of our own um, medical homes within our own clinic and our own culture, but also within the culture of Wasatch. So let's see. So our, our office is still fairly new at trying to get on board with the whole medical home thing. So it's been kind of nice to have these kind of things that I can take back to my doctors who haven't quite caught the vision of what medical home is. So having these kinds of things and working together as a team within Wasatch has been nice that I can go back and have these wonderful forms of things already in place that I can go and take to and be like, okay, so this is what we're doing, this is what we need to do. And it's been helpful for them to kind of understand, I guess, the, uh, the need for it and what, what we are doing is helpful to their patients. So. Has there been a little pushback, or I mean, maybe that's the wrong word, but not, not embracing with open arms? Um, it has been with a few of our doctors. I just think that they're they're kind of set in their ways. They're a little, they've been practicing for a longer time, so they're kind of set in their ways and just haven't quite understood what the vision is of this. So having these kind of things helps with that. And, you know, with the little things we have done, I mean, they have come back and reported and said, oh, that's been helpful. You know, I like it when you call our patients to find out what's going on before their appointment so then they know what they're going into. So we're slowly getting there, but it's <laughs> nice to have, you know, these clinics that are a little bit farther along so then that way if I do have questions to report back, then I can rely on them and they help me out with that too. So I think what I heard there is that little steps, yeah. little tweaks, little you should get the, you should get the buy <laughs> Right. Well, if they're not on board with it, right. then it's 
it's pointless to do. I don't think you're doing the right stuff if you tell them why we need it. Right. You know, so, help us to help us out and do that. So, yeah. Perfect. So that's where we're at. So it's nice that they're kind of a little farther along. So when we do get to that point, everything's already in place for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm going to throw the ball over to Integrated Services. And I have your conference as well. So why don't, if you guys want to start talking, I'll put the intake form. Sure. So for a lot of years, we were offering clinical services through uh, Bureau of Children and Special Health Training, so direct care to kids. We saw a lot of children for autism evaluation, developmental delays, issues like that. So there was an existing intake form that we used to kind of find out where's the family coming from, what are their needs, what, are their, what do they view as the strengths of their child, what's something you want us to know about your kiddo. Just kind of this get to know you sort of a thing. And some developmental milestones, just some information for us to know when did, you, when did your child walk, when did they talk, some things like that may or may not be relevant in the, in the grand scheme of things. Sometimes they are, sometimes not. So we kind of borrowed that to a certain degree when we started the care coordination piece. We've been doing care coordination since July. And we're in a, a somewhat unique situation in that we are not in a physician's office. So we're kind of doing this third party. We're helping offices that may have limited staff or limited capability limited um, capacity to provide some more in-depth care coordination for some of their patients. So um, when we get a referral, our care coordinators will kind of go through this. This is a template in our EMR, and it has a lot of like pickers. So you select things that are relevant, and it will show up on the, on the final copy. If it's not something that you need to select, you don't pick, and you don't put any text after it. The only thing is, though, you're balancing a phone while you're clacking on a keyboard trying to enter all of this stuff. So sometimes it's a little bit tricky trying to do that. Um, so that's our kind of our initial intake, and it can expand to be quite a bit or not a lot, depending on how complicated the child is. Based off of that, all of our um, care coordinators create a care plan. Now, the one piece in our office is there's not a unique well, I should say everyone is unique. We don't have a specified protocol to say these are some required elements or this is a format that we think everybody should follow. So each of the care coordinators is doing a great job coming up with the family to develop goals, objectives, things that they would like to accomplish, have the family accomplish, but everybody's kind of doing their own unique style. So. Much to the chagrin of my staff, I threw together this template, which has not been vetted by them, nor has it been used in any professional situation, um, just to try to have something that would be somewhat of a standard, if you will, within our organization. I borrowed some of these ideas from a document out there. It's a Lucille Packard Foundation um, document that talks about care coordination and, and uh, planning, and it's done by um, a woman named Jeannie McAllister out of one of the I states, Indiana, Iowa, Indiana, okay. one of the Corn Belt states, and um, she and a, a group of folks kind of came up with some standards, and there's, there's, when you look at this document, it's redundant because it talks about collecting information in this section, but then collecting that information again in another section. So. On this one, I just tried to simplify it a little bit into just some broad categories. So what the goal would be for our team this year is to try to work on having some sort of a format that is somewhat standard with categories that are standard. Well, the ultimate goal is um, as we look towards the ability to share this information electronically among disparate EMRs, so amongst various specialists and other providers who would be sharing the information, Sometimes you need to be able to have categories that are somewhat standard so that when you query the system, you can look for word patterns and display that information and share that information among various systems. Um, big difference between data fields in a database where you go in and you can query and you can, you know, you have five values and you can you know, select from those five values versus a text field which historically had been rather unqueryable. A text field was a text field. 
But now with some of this word matching technology and, and patterns that it can look for, that then becomes a little bit more queryable. So in the immediate, that's not as important, but down the road, it may be an important piece to have. And so we thought we'd try to move in that direction so that we have those categorical pieces in place as the technology advances. So um, these plans are available to our families through um, the patient portal. They can log into our uh, EMR and families can pull that information that uh, the care plan, anything that's been an assessment that we've done, so they have a history of all of those documents. Families can also upload documents into the system, so if they need a storage place for items, they can <laughs> scan attachments into the system. They can also go into that medical record and they can update medications and other, you know, other providers, other, other problems, things like that. On our end, they show up as green, we take a peek and the family's edited. And once we accept that information, that can then feed into the care plan. And so some of the pieces, like patient procedures, patient problems, patient allergies, those are macros. They pull straight out of the EMR. So if we have correct and updated information in there, um, then when we pull up a new care plan, all of that stuff just dumps over from the EMR um, right into this form. A lot of the rest of these are just kind of fill out as you go type pieces. And it certainly is not pretty to look at like that gorgeous document that you created. So um, our, our, our word processing capabilities on this thing are a little bit limited. Um, bolding doesn't happen so much and you know just some things to really make it stand out. It's a very limited word processor within the system. So visually um, I don't love it but it's kind of within the capabilities of our EMR. Yeah, it's a local group, that's it's called CADURX, C-A-D-U-R-X, and uh, the state, always in the quest to get more bang for their buck, um, <laughs> low bid and all the rest of it, um, went with this group. But the nice thing about it was because we're a multidisciplinary group, they were able to tail, we're a multidisciplinary group, so they were able to tailor the EMR to meet some of our unique needs of having multiple specialists seen by a child on one day. So it wasn't just one provider, one encounter, it was multiple providers, multiple encounters for one child. So they were able to specialize some things for us. And you said they've been pretty open to requests or? Well, back in the days when we were giving them a lot of money, yes. Okay. Um, we've, not, we've not really asked them for a lot of tweakage lately, but if we needed to move in that direction, then you know we could on some of those changes, I'm sure they would they would listen. They've always been really good to work with us in the past. So within Wasatch, it sounds like you've got the support from the overall organization, but has that moved into the IT realm yet and the money realm at all? The idea of trying to get some of these forms to work more naturally with the Greenway? Well, I've um, taken one of the the first form that Jenna showed and started to develop a template off of that. But that was, I mean, it takes a while to get that developed where it's fully usable. Off the first one with, yeah, off the, yeah, so care planning that has the follow-up, not the assessment. But it takes, it takes a bit to kind of get everything, I don't know, where it needs to be. And it's hard, yeah, <laughs> well, it's like ugly and hard to use. Yeah. <laughs> Greenway is the same kind of thing for us um, when we were giving a lot of money and they were making a few changes or whatever. But mm -hmm. now within Prime Tree, the care company for Greenway, um, there's a pediatric users group. It's actually a fairly large group. And that's a, you know, the national company. So I think the pediatric users group is getting some work done. But to have our form put into a like Greenway template or So yeah, I'm sure that the IT and EMR kind of hurdles exist for pretty much every every organization. And I'm kind of curious to know from from the rest of you, what kind of support would you think that you might have within your organization to start moving in some of these directions? Because this this requires time on your end, uh, maybe a lot of time at least at the, the 
getting. Um, and it also, what's that? And it requires, it requires a team, it requires support, and it requires, you know, the information that the forms are capturing to be disseminated, understood, acted upon, uh, and documented again. So it's not, yeah, I mean, it's, it can be great to be a business where they're like, go for it, but if the others on that team aren't going to, you know, step up at the point in time where it's, it's their, their action time, um, that's not going to work so well. So we're just really curious to know from others. So what, what are your experiences with trying to do more quality improvement and kind of formalizing some of these? Um, we are still just trying to get my the doctors are taking it, but the nurses are very resistant to it. Oh, it seems odd, but that's what we're fighting right now. But now whereas Mindy and probably she's been doing this forever, so but our office has been doing this is a new thing just over the last year and so it's still I can help with that. No, I'll just do it. No, really, let me. You know, it sounds like the you know Indian program for the long as her and she has the system in place. Right. I don't know if that's what I mean, but I don't use the key office. So if I can just give you some encouragement, when we first started this, we had a lot of pushback from um, from our MA staff as well because they're they're very um, good at what they do. They were used to doing a lot of things that. Um, they were just used to doing everything. And I came in the, into the position from being an MA, and I, it, people felt like I was stepping on their toes. They'll come around. Yeah. They will come they around. They are coming around. Now it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and the, more, the thing is, is, the more specialized your knowledge becomes, the more you'll see that change happen. I feel for you. It's a hard place to be here. <laughs> the other thing that we'd like to ask is, you know, how how can we help with this? Um, uh, the Wasatch Peaks of the South Point um, forms are available, um, so we, we can send those around. Um, we can also put a version of them, um, kind of be identified on the care coordination page on the medical home portal, so that's a place you we go back and download and find those. Um, so we can do that. We can we can make all of these available so that if you want to kind of look at a bunch, um, I, you know, I, I've got there are a lot of um, care plans that are in existence out there, and there are a lot of organizations um, that are are trying to look at those and make them um, more widely available so that you can take them and customize them and use them as in a way that's best for your organization. Awesome. So Children's Hospital has a really good form for them. Oh, yeah. we, we're, we want to help in any way we possibly can. So whether it's from you know suggesting some some form formats to potentially even helping at the you know in your practice in a QI sort of way. So that's that's what UPIC does. And if that would be a value to you, you know, let us know. Um, if you feel like your practice might be ready to sort of take a more formal step into some of these processes, because that's when they get and, um, and, there, and again, we've talked about this a lot, that um, really you can't expect to be ultimately compensated, not necessarily you, but you know, the, the collective you and the collective us um, in pediatrics for care coordination unless it's proven that it's happening. So you've got to document this. So this is a way to document as well. So it's, got, it's a win-win. Win. <laughs> so. Okay, well that's awesome. So. Um, I think we're pretty close to our time, so unless there are other questions, I'll move back into the PowerPoint and just um, think we're at our wrap-up point pretty much. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you sharing your
interested in getting in contact with university health plans about doing some case management related seminars that have some continuing education credits associated with them. There are three different uh, topics. One was kind of broad um, case management, everything you wanted to know. Uh, the other one was um, transition, uh, it had to do with transitioning, and then the third one was motivational interviewing. Um, so I've been in touch with them. I actually have an appointment to speak with the, the person who will be on the seminar tomorrow, so I'll learn a little bit more. But there may be an opportunity to feedback on what they're doing with University Health Plan at the end of March. These are four, three to four hour seminars, so they will require a bit of a commitment. They're done remotely, but you gather with all of the attendees in a room. Um, and that, I would assume, promotes a little bit of a community and, and collective questions and those kinds of things. And so this would be the motivational interviewing one at the end of March. So I'll have more information tomorrow that I'll send out. But she said, they said, we'd be happy to do these seminars for your group. So if we do want to follow up with them just for the UCCCN group, um, we, we can do that. And, and we certainly can. And I'm particularly interested in the motivational interviewing ones because it sounds like you could use these techniques on your nurses. <laughs> you know? I think um, that having some of those tools in your, your toolkit could really be useful in a lot of different scenarios. So I'm kind of excited about that. We'll see if we can make that happen. Oh, sorry. The March 17th is our next meeting here. Oh, sorry. yeah. Yeah, I didn't clarify that very well on the slide. I, my apologies. Um, I kind of don't want to say a date yet for this particular one that she mentioned, because I don't know if we're going to have the ability to go kind of jump into the University Health Plan seminar, which is already scheduled. So I'll, I'll work with her. But they were very, I mean, they were emailing me at night and on a weekend. So I think these folks are responsive and would be very happy to put these on for us. And it's free, as far as I understand. So um, it'll more be a matter of you guys finding the time to come all on a day. So we'll, I'll continue to work on that. I'll send that information out. Um, but I'm excited about those, those opportunities. Yeah, sorry, question. Can they make those pediatrics? They are pediatrics. Oh, they are, right. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 I, think, I think that's true. Um, so I just put it out as my 17th of Thursday. That is true. <laughs> I bet I didn't change the number on there. Oops. Yeah, it's like March. Probably it's March 16th. March 16th. So, yeah. I just made that not stay in your brain. <laughs> anyway, um, that that information will all go out in the resources of the month email that we'll send in the next day or so. And we're done. So thanks, everyone. I have parking validations, but if you haven't signed in, would you sign in just because we have to show for federal funding matters that we're actually giving parking validations. <laughs>